really delighted to work with, um, with Jesse, and I'm just going to ask Jesse to say a little bit about uh, the pieces that are in the church at the moment. Um, perhaps I can say maybe from my point of view why we as a church are embarking on these conversations and uh, interventions. Um, and this is, this is simply from my point of view as a priest that I want this place and believe this place to be a place where truth can be told. And as a priest, I suppose I want us to find as many ways as we can to tell those truths. And they're multivalent and multilayered quite often. Um, and the church historically has had a pretty difficult reputation in proclaiming capital T, the capital T, T truth. And I think that for an incubator space like this, an experimental space like this, perhaps there are many other truths that we can discover together, new truth. And working with artists is one of the ways that we are exploring to find those truths, to tell the truth about the human condition, about the world we live in, what it's like to be alive, what it's like to die, all those questions that the church has traditionally been uh, involved in. So from our point of view, that's a kind of a why we want to have these kinds of conversations. And we don't assume that people want to have those conversations with us at all. Um, so that's why it's really a particular pleasure that Jesse, you've agreed to have this uh, conversation with our congregation. Um, and perhaps, could I just ask you to say, what, 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 is, what are we here What's surrounded by? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. uh, I w hello, thanks for staying. I will say that, but I also want to thank you and you guys and Richard, because for me this was um, a bit of a dream gig. At the moment, it's Freeze Art Fair, which, if you don't know, is the big... Um, it, it's like Ikea, but for artworks, but it's also this kind of moment in the calendar for visual artists around which all of this energy gets generated, but it's really a very profane place. And, you know, I don't use this word lightly, so it, it's where all of our work, our love, you know, our, our making, our truth, or whatever, becomes reduced very... Um, very nakedly to capital value. And it's really great to be in a space where we, we can disagree, but some of the objects in the church, they don't just signify, they do have value that vastly exceeds, you know, capital value, which is amazing because it feels like that's what I've been waiting my whole life for, you know. Um, so, uh, I'm also ambivalent about capital T truth, and I don't believe in it, I have to say. And I wanted to make a work that was agonistic, as in uh, it, it sort of does something in the space, but it's not antagonistic, because it's your church, and I want to be respectful and, um, you know, not occupy and resist, but to present a, a kind of different version or whatever. So my pitch, before I started making these things, which I did in four days with George Lynch in Deptford last week, um, I pitched a kind of choir, which was the mirror of the congregation, that was the idea. And this was after actually attending the sanctuary service and seeing the lay community singing and praying. And I thought, that's what we're all doing, you know sitting in church, but in general, everybody's trying to find the signal and failing. And crucially, everybody's signal is at a different place on the dial. So we don't get to a place, or very rarely do we get to a place where we're all part of the same ether and the signal is true and the music is clear. And, and I wanted to, that's basically, I, I sort of wanted to show how I think about the act of worship, which is also the act of making or being together as a community, which is that basically it's kind of doomed to failure of some kind, but we try, and that's what's human about us, and that's also what the 
attributes of Saint Icarus is about. Um, Icarus obviously died for his hubris, but at the same time, he wanted to be close to the sun. I mean, who doesn't want to be close to the sun? So, I'm, you know, I'm ambivalent in general, but I think that's also at the heart of my project in general. And so, it's super cool to 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 get to say that stuff here. Uh, and this is miserere. Can you say a bit about what that is? Well, miserere, as you probably know, uh, just means mercy and. Um, and also, you know, it, as I looked it up, because I thought it had to be a Latin term, and I wanted three works in the church <laughs> for the, you know, the obvious reasons. Uh, but Miserere, actually was listening again to a hymn here. I mean, I've, I've been at some of the services in and out. I've been hanging around a lot. And Miserere may, um, Miserere nobis, have, have mercy on me, mercy on us. And, you know, the, the, this is also the, the kind of seeking and, and failing somehow. Like, you don't, you don't ask if you know the answer's yes. You know what I mean? So there's always this kind of, if you're asking, maybe it's already no. It's a prayer, so it's sent out and you just hope. Um, and so that's mercy. Mercy as a kind of act of, of asking. But it also means um, there's a kind of vomiting sickness that was called miserere. And it's also a kind of architecture, it turns out, for those who can't stand or, 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 or who are mm -hmm. physically impaired to kind of, it sort of props up a pew, a kneeling pew. And that also seemed very um, appropriate for these sort of precarious things. So, yeah. I wonder what you think of, I was really interested in mercy as the, one of the themes of this, and I wonder what you think of, in theological terms, when we ask for mercy, I love that, that we, we don't ask if we expect the answer, or we know the answer is yes, so it's, it's an unknowing question, but we need mercy, arguably, because we know we are both powerful and needy. The reason I'm saying that is, we wouldn't need mercy unless there was something to kind of get us back from where we've, where we've strayed to, which means we have agency, but also we're in need. And it seems to me that those are two quite problematic aspects of our humanity. We don't often inhabit our need. I think artists help us inhabit our need, but we also sometimes don't admit our agency. That's a well, theological the agency point, but I don't also know what you think. Asking, yeah. Yeah. The agency is also in all of the structures, the, the, the scriptures, the theology, the artworks, you know, that's, that's the agency. And increasingly it feels like uh, in this economy, under this government, and at this moment, for some of us, that really is, our, you know, pretty much the only agency. I mean, not to push that point too far, but... Uh, I also think there's something about an old world order breaking down, and the idea of agency itself is, is already starting to, um, uh, you know, um, that's the, the kind of imperial human, you know, who thought that he, usually he, would be agent over the whole world, nature, and the other. And that was also kind of founded in theology, as you know, you know. Um, but I think this idea of agencies and mercy, you know, that, that, that's also, that's the thing, that is the heart of the condition or whatever. That yeah, on the one hand, we do have agency, but do we have free will? Big question, um, somehow. And with that free will slash agency, there's the, there's all, you know, we always ask for more. It's like there's the story of the, the fisherman's wife or whatever, you know, three wishes and then, and that's also part of, that's the Icarus story. There's a kind of hubris in the asking. So mercy is, doesn't feel so hubristic. And I think that was kind of why I'm interested in it. It's also beautiful. It, it has a whole poetry just on its own, the word. So, yeah. You've mentioned Icarus. Just, I can ask you to turn around and look. 
Could you say a little bit that this was an existing work that you've it chosen was, to yeah. place here? Could you say something about that particularly? Well, I mean, it's obviously some kind of a crucifix, really. You know, I mean, it's like the big JC, you know, the, the outstretched arms and part of the iconography. But I was thinking about this is an this is an Anglican church, and it's maybe a bit more um, towards the Catholic end of things, or the saints. Um, but I was thinking about these folk figures who enjoy a lot of plasticity. You know, a lot of people feel um, a claim to appropriate their figure, the fig, these folk figures, and do whatever they want with them. So Icarus is a kind of an example from art history, a kind of classical example. So was Icarus a person? Don't know. Um, but anyway, the figure of Icarus has been painted, drawn, you know, riffed on, sung about. He's a, he's a, he's a, yeah, for me, he's Saint Icarus. And over there is uh, Lady Batman, our Lady Batman of the empty center. And maybe this sounds also super hubristic and problematic, but if I think about the superheroes, the pantheon of the superheroes, the Marvel Universe, whatever. I don't care about that stuff. I'm not the, this kind of nerd. But I was interested in the fact that, yeah, they, you know, every kid draws them. They, they kind of have their own iconography. They're saints, basically, or they function as saints. And in the project that both of these works um, were made for, the, the Ballad of Saint Jerome, which I was looking at the story of Jerome and the lion, from the lion's perspective, kind of. I got into a correspondence with the Reverend Tina Beardsley and she, she was talking, we were talking a lot about saints, particularly female saints. And yeah, it turns out they're still canonizing people all the time. So Harvey Milk is a saint. Trayvon Martin is a, has a feast day. The martyr Trayvon Martin, whose death sparked the Black Lives Matter movement. And so there's something about these folk figures that um, for me is, really important because like the figure of Jesus, it's some, somebody, you know, a person like us who we can c kind of project onto and project into. And the other thing is that the history of the, you know, modern art, contemporary art comes directly from a Christian iconography, which is kind of also speaks to the Eurocentrism of, of contemporary art, because if we were coming from an Islamic perspective, and of course there is an Islamic art tradition and an Islamic art world too, but then you don't depict the, the prophet or the saint figure, you know, that's, you don't do that. But in Christian iconography, which I inherit as a European subject, you do. And that's a big part of, you know, church art is these Figures, and they are also everywhere in this church, but less than some other churches, maybe. But you can see plenty of figures around. And I, of course, like I'm a, I'm a contemporary artist working in the European lineage, and so that's my history as well. So I've studied it quite a lot in my not very, not very scholarly way. I'm struck by what you said about Icarus, because as you say, the story is one of hubris and it's supposed to be a lesson to us, right? That we, you know, if we get too big, we're, we're cut down in some way. But um, you spoke quite compassionately about Icarus wanting to be close to the sun. Doesn't everyone want to be close to the sun? Do you think the answer is yes to that? I mean, in a particular time in someone's life, yeah, sure. I mean, I think that that kind of hubris or longing or curiosity even is also just human. So, I, so this is maybe slightly, um, you know, in, in, in canonizing Icarus and saying, look, he just wanted what we all want, that in, in some Christian communities, that would be quite a heretical position. But for me, and taking it seriously as a respectful theological um, proposition, uh, he, this curiosity should also not be punished. You know, it wasn't a sin that he, you know, he wasn't, nobody was gonna be harmed but him. He wasn't hurting anyone. And what he wanted was something which, you know, he was punished for in, in the kind of essentially ecclesiastical history of myths. So he's also a Christian myth, more or less. Or at least his story has been Christianized. And I'm like, well, you know, 
flew to his own death, but what he, what he wanted is it was a human one. And I think that that can more broadly, you know, if I'm really pushing it and I'm pushing it, you can extend this into queer desire, you can extend it into various forms of self-expression, even the prerogative to make art in general, which in, in some contexts, Christian contexts and other religious contexts, has itself been, you know, disallowed implicitly or explicitly. So it's just another way of seeing him. And when I was talking about St. Jerome and the lion before, I thought at first that it was a very beautiful love story that Jerome healed the lion and took the lion in. And then I thought, I spent a lot of time in hospitals at that time. I was very sick and I just had a baby and it was a combination of things that had, me, had a lot to do with doctors. And uh, I thought then, what is a lion doing in the library actually? And, and, what if, and what about healing might be coercive? And how did Jerome, the, the patriarch and the scholar, kind of tame the lion, who was a wild thing and who was wounded, but, you know, was free? So, I mean, again, it's not my, I don't want to, I don't want to be heretical for the sake of it. I want to enter into the myths from, from, from a kind of more, you could say, humanistic perspective. But I wouldn't say secular. I'm taking them seriously on their own terms. Mm -hmm. And this too, I mean, uh, the radios are very, you know, it was supposed to be something very, very basic, like a simple one-one punchline that anyone could get, um, which it is. You know, oh yeah, radios, and they're like a choir, right? And they sit there and, and everyone gets that. And there's the radio is kind of, the FM radio, kind of this platonic technology that everyone recognizes, you know as something which is seeking and sometimes finding. And it was important to make it super simple so that it wasn't kind of, you know, arty or intellectual, you know, that everybody could get something from it. I mean, I guess, yeah, the proposition that they're seeking and not finding was, I mean, some, sometimes it turns out they're really responsive. And so with the floodlights, they, they start shouting and when, they get hit by a sunbeam, then they kind of do tune into a station, and then, yeah, ABBA or the Bee Gees would blare out. And initially, it was like they're supposed to be tuned to the edge of a station so that they'd sometimes, you'd sometimes get it. But then they kind of had to be tuned away from that because they were picking up too much. And then the theological proposition of that work was that the Bee Gees Magic FM is God. And I said this to Ayla who looked at me and said very seriously without smiling, well, I think that Magic FM does channel the divine. <laughs> I was like, yeah, me, well, me too, but sometimes. <laughs> okay. But still, you know, it felt like a bit too stronger. <laughs> Actually, yeah. towards the end of this, we, I mean, we should say that this is, um, this is an audible piece of art as well. So, I mean, towards the end, perhaps we can switch it on and then just sit and, and, lis and listen. We've switched it off for audibility reasons now, but certainly if you come into the church and they're on, I celebrated the Eucharist at the, on the, at the side chapel on Thursday, and there was certainly some really, um, uh, what's the word, surprising um, interventions into the liturgy from some of the, some of the radios, which I... <laughs> you know, which we spoke about, we, we wanted to kind of welcome and, and not co-opt or colonize, but simply be in conversation with. But, you know, that's, a, that's quite an interesting thing in itself. Um, could, could I ask you to say a little bit more about um, what's in the side chapel? And particularly, you've talked a little bit about the queer, the queer practice. And I think that's particularly maybe with relation to the, uh, to the Batman piece there. Could you say a little bit about that? behind the side altar? Well, I mean, I, I, I sort of resist the idea of making queer work or whatever, but mm. um, I mean, obviously everyone knows that Batman is this big mask, macho. Um, I mean, Batman always struck me actually as a closeted gay man with his leather suit and his butler mm. and Robin and all that stuff. But um, anyway, I just changed Batman's gender. Why? not sure except the Batman of the of the greatest superhero pantheon is the one that was not born with magical powers and um, what Batman has is a lot of trauma you know he lost his parents and it's kind of not not all there you know he's damaged and with his damage 
he kind of gets into the streets of Gotham and does this uh, white savior act, or perhaps he just channels his damage into, he's like the wounded healer, you know, Chiron, that's Batman. Uh, that's what he's trying to do, which is a problematic position, but there's something about it that he's a hubristic figure for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, so in changing Batman's gender was just, uh, I didn't, I, I don't, I, you know, that's really an icon. I didn't want to make an icon of, I mean, in any Marvel franchise or the new Batman movie, you have Christian Bale or whatever, the six pack and the Batman thing, that's an icon too. Mm -hmm. And they already exist, so I wanted to make a different kind of one. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't, I, would, I mean, I wouldn't say I thought about this. It was just one of those things that came out of the process. You know, working like praying, just, or whatever. You know. Um, I guess that she is also this wounded figure, maybe torn open, maybe begging, maybe offering. I was interested in the Eucharist in in front of her, because it's the cup and the it's the body and the blood, and that's basically she's holding that out. But she also has this affect of somebody who's like, you know, any change. And it could be both, you know. I think that, for me, that's, um, that's probably what, one of my most important favorite works that I've ever made, and I, I won't sell it, because I can't bear to think of it somewhere in storage or on someone's wall. Or, so she has waited her whole life for this moment <laughs> to, to have <laughs> some real veneration, the Eucharist in front of her. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. It, it, there's a, I think she's saying or doing a lot of things which I can't cleanly talk about or I wouldn't have made the work. But I could just talk about what, what is going on there and you can all go and have a look and make up your own minds, which is also completely legitimate. And not, by the way, I think a form of co-option or colonization, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just, it is what it is. One of the things that I think we're, we're trying here is to not simply be, I mean, it's a one-liner you've heard me use before, that churches are not art galleries. Um, it is itself a piece of art, this building, and it's full of art, and obviously we talk about Grilling Gibbons and you know the artists whose spirits are part of the history of this place, like William Blake, for example. But um, to be in a genuine conversation with contemporary art is not a, is not a straightforward thing um, for, for the church. And I'm imagining it's not a straightforward thing for artists either. But that's, that's our intent, not to simply host an art exhibition, but somehow to be in conversation. So one of the things that um, occurred to me as I celebrated the Eucharist in the side chapel, you were talking about the wound in the cup. Um, in Christian theology, blood signifies um, salvation on the cross and sacrifice but blood also for example with the woman who is hemorrhaging in uh, in the Gospels that story is, is she needs to be she needs to be healed from that in some way so blood actually is not straightforward in Christian iconography and that, that became more present to me as I celebrated with with this wound and the wounds of Christ on the altar so that actually we're we're categorizing different people's blood as meaning different things. And that's, that's problematic. I think we should problematize that in, in Christian iconography. And I don't think I'd quite thought that, uh, that hadn't quite presented itself to me as it did when I celebrated there. So in that, in that sense, there is a, a conversation going on um, between the art and the liturgy. And it is our intent to, to perform our liturgies around the art as well, which is important, important for us. Um, I mean, sorry to interrupt, yeah, but I please. think, so Jesus Christ probably did die. In my view, I'm sorry, I probably didn't come back from the dead, just given that nobody else ever has, he probably didn't either. I mean, or maybe in some sense, but okay, let me just say it like this. Probably yeah. he died from his wounds. Um, as any other human body would have. And the, the fact that he lives on or, or, or came back in some form, you know, I don't dispute that as a, as a symbolic, um, you know, venture that this happened. Mm -hmm. What does it mean for something to have happened? But basically, 
if, if, if he was a man, even the son of God, then he would have died of that. Mm. And I, I guess when you were just saying that blood on the one hand is, is, is you know, it's the, it's the blood of Christ which heals, but it's also the thing, you know, if someone's hemorrhaging, they need mm. to be healed. I guess the big thing is the fact that he came back so that, he, you know, it's like these um, weirdos who, who, who um, you know, try to inject the blood of young people because they think it will give them eternal life, mm. which is another Christian idea. Mm. Um, but what if, he, what if he did die of it and then everybody who's bleeding out needs healed, but at the same time, because we inherit this very compelling, seductive, and important story of, the, of his blood or, or somebody's blood itself being a healing elixir, then we have to take seriously that, you know, as a poetic or symbolic idea that, that actually, do that you know what I'm saying? That there's all the blood that, that flows will, will in the end kill the person, you know, everybody will bleed out in the end. And then there's something about this healing thing. For me, that what's, what's most persuasive about Jesus is that he was just a person mm. and, and that he probably died from his wounds. Mm. And for me, that's what makes him feel like somebody I could relate to. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's also not his blood. It's, it's, something, it's something else. It's wine. It's the symbol of. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that lately about this idea of what if, he did, what, if, what if he just died, and that's actually the thing. Anyway, just to throw that out. Yeah, well, I mean... <laughs> Complicated. Not at all, no. I, th there's a really interesting reflection on that in Mark's... So Mark's Gospel, as you know, is the shortest and the oldest Gospel, and it doesn't have the resurrection in it. That was added later. So, in fact, mm. Mark's Gospel, the whole thrust of Mark's Gospel goes towards the crucifixion, and there's this phrase constantly in Mark that the Son of Man is lifted up, but it's not really explained what that means, and that could, that could mean that the crucifix is lifted up, and that that's the moment of, they would say, a telos moment, the fulfillment mm. moment, the moment that means something. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm not here to, to deny or debate the resurrection, but I simply want to offer that one of our Gospels has that resurrection story added um, a little later, and the thrust of the gospel itself goes towards the cross rather than the empty tomb. So we're holding, we're holding those two together, I would say. Yeah, probably. totally. Um, totally. Um, we have some time for some questions uh, from the audience, if, you would, if you'd like to ask something or I mean, anything about anything that you see around you of, of Jesse or of me. We'd be delighted to have a question. Sorry, we have to use a microphone because of the acoustics and um, recording. Could you just say a little bit about um, how you present them on these stands, the piece behind you? Uh, because for me, it really echoes uh, these. So just to repeat that, um, Jesse, could you say something about how you've presented this? And for you, it echoes these lights, perhaps, or the, 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 the stands, yeah. Yes, well, as Lucy said, it's not an art gallery. And I walked in and was like, I don't know what to do here. The group show has been installed for 7,000 years <laughs> or whatever, you know. Um, maybe not 7,000, but yeah. Yeah, so, it, so yes, it was supposed to be, um, they're kind of like roughly the size of a person, a, a tall man or, you know, we made some that were children, but then we, you know, we thought of these guys as the choristers, you know, a boys choir, the three with the white. And then these are, yeah, I don't know, bass section. And then they're maybe less, less like the Protestant choir. Maybe they're more like a gospel choir. There's a bit more movement um, in, you know, which is a bit, don't see that so much with certain choral traditions. But they were supposed to be like figures and they were also supposed to be, I mean, steel, this kind of raw steel, I use a lot because it's cheap and I can easily throw something together with it that is a kind of a drawing in space. But it also um, kind of looks not quite like anything here, 
but also does look like things here. So this is wood and the kind of finish and texture. Um, it's not mirrored here, but the kinds of linearity was, it was a bit supposed to be a, a kind of mirroring. So yeah, totally, they do look a bit like this, or at least speak to that. Hello. Oh, you can hear that. Um, it's not a question. I just wanted to say thank you because I came to Sanctuary on Tuesday and I was really struggling with something quite difficult and not knowing what to do. And I came in and I just saw them and I just thought, oh, and then I knew what to do. And I just want to say thank you so much because it really made a huge difference. Thank you. Some other comments or questions? I might just ask on whilst, uh, whilst others formulate. Um, mm. uh, there was an amazing evening of performances on Thursday. And, and, and on that evening, uh, you mentioned how um, back in uh, years ago, um, you'd received a grant to um, make a new religion as, a, as, a, as an artwork in a way, which is a fascinating thing. Um, and, and I guess I was wondering, having done this project in a church and sort of seeing the, um, the kind of ebb and flow of church life, I guess, uh, whether, whether you sort of thought again about that or I guess reflections, yeah, since, since doing this project on that work or others that kind of pointed to religion, I guess. I mean, I don't think so much about that work. I think it, 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 was a, it was a failure as far as I'm concerned, but it was also very, very exciting. It was one of the most exciting projects I've ever been part of because of the sense that there was something at stake. But actually, not, I didn't connect it, but being here all week, I understand why it didn't work. Um, and I know why, and I understand why this does, you know? And, and I have so much respect for it. And also I'm very drawn to it actually, despite like some theological differences, quite major ones maybe about <laughs> the figure of Jesus, for example, and uh, you know, some other ambivalences, but basically um, it struck me that, um, yeah, Thursday night, for example, just to say a little bit about that, I had this idea that we, the more or less secular um, people who use our bodies or texts or, or artworks to kind of um, to, as a, like making as a form of prayer and, and, that it, and it is that and to take it seriously as a kind of observance which is not religious but also not atheistic um, and I wanted to see what would happen if that space could be activated as a service and I did think about it as a service for any of the congregation who might want to show up or whoever and Lucy spoke. Mm -hmm. Lucy jumped on the <laughs> mic <laughs> and got a cheer. <laughs> and, and I have to say, read the room really well and had the perfect words for the congregation that was gathered there. And um, many people, I think, found something important in that. And also just the kind of juxtaposition of these different kinds of observance, you know, in this space. But I was thinking about all the people who came and did stuff and and, I, and some of them I know well, some not, but we all come from, you know, art, political organizing, different sort of, you know, and especially now everybody's really struggling because there's no resources and um, it's hard to sort of, it's hard to maintain community and politics and, and, and service actually, whether it's your artistic practice or the, or the service that you've got to the community without structure and continuity and, and community. And here at St. James's, honestly, sitting here and usually the back, I'm thinking, yeah, this is why it works. You know, there's all of those things. And it doesn't really matter if you don't agree with everything. There's some really crucial continuity in it. And the space itself, like this church in particular, and also because of you and what, you know, how you run it, 
feels very good to be in and like a good, a good space to just sit. And that's the resources and the continuity is in the offering of the services, the fact that people come, the, 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 the hymns you all know, the prayers you all know. And there's something so powerful about it. And I was like, yeah, that's why it didn't work. You can't just pull it out of nowhere, you know? And these things become, what, what we did learn in that project, like start a religion with arts funding money. What I learned especially is the big takeaway that doing produces believing. So, you know, if you, if you practice a ritual enough, even if it feels a bit silly at first, in the end, it works. You know, whatever you're looking for it to do, it will start to do that. It will do something. And that's, I think, what you, can, what you offer, among other things. I, I really, I mean, from in, if I can call it inside the church, and the church is, amongst other things, an institution. We try hard not to be too much of an institution. But we're, we're a gathering and a community, all the things that you've said. And um, there's two things I wanted to just ask you. One was, what do you, you've said a little bit about it already, but one of the things that exercises me is what's the relationship between ritual and belief? So do you do something in order to help you believe it? Or do you believe something and do you wait until you believe it in order to do it? No, I don't think so. I have quite a strong position on that. After years and years of community organizing, making art, doing stuff with different people, you know, now I have a five-year-old child and, and what I strongly believe is it, it's not really about what you believe, ultimately. And this is also, I hope this isn't controversial, but when I look at you guys and the people who come to the services, some on Sunday, Tuesday, mm. Thursday, really what, what mostly there is in common is this practice. Mm. And practice also implies failure, right? You practice, mm. you practice, you fail, mm. you get better, you practice. And not so much, um, you know, it's not like, oh, these are my people, we agree on everything, we're, this, we're identified this way, that way, we come from this place. It's not like that, it's, it's practice. Everyone comes and does something, and that doing something together, you could also call it labor, it's work, you know, and through this work, something is produced. And especially now, you know, there's a, yeah, there's a kind of fractalization of identities and, and, and pretty fractious times in general. And I think it's really like, that's the thing. It's not about really what you believe or who you are. It's about the project that you share. And I think consenting and agreeing to, to look past your differences and to, to just show up together to sing or to, to pray or whatever, that is itself doing something. So that's, and I've also learned that again this week, you know, and it's very powerful to see it. It's a really good challenge to a model, I think, of church, which thinks somehow that, I mean, it's a fantasy as a priest, it's a fantasy for me to think that I can control what anyone believes. I mean, it, and, and, but priests have carried that fantasy for generations and sometimes have, you know, with violence, um, imposed it on, on groups or congregations. It's really, it's really difficult. And, you know, there's a joke about pulpits that you're six foot above contradiction that, you know, they're, you're, you're up. <laughs> Ostensibly, you can, you can narrate it architecturally to say, well, it's to enable people to be able to see and hear you. But actually, it's, I mean, it's very problematic to, to be put up there and to declaim uh, downwards. But I think that's, it's a big, I'm agreeing with you, Jesse, but I, I'm saying it's a big problem within organized religion that that pull to centralization and to, to try to to try to define or coerce is really but it's not. It's, it's also a big problem on the organi in, in, in organized the left right. politics or right. whatever, you right. know, that this idea that you all have to absolutely agree on bloody everything and you also <laughs> yeah. have to be the same sort of person. It's just such a fiction and, I, and, mm. and it doesn't mm. work, you know, like mm. if we got to get something done and we do and we really have to get something done, you know, there's a lot of work to do now for everyone and things have never been harder. So I think that, but also, you know, you do do it here, that's what's happening. Mm. So yeah, great mm. to be a part of that and to relearn it. Another question, oh, Mariama, yes. Thank you, Richard. 
Hello, I hope you can hear me. Hi, thank you so much for um, these beautiful pieces. I had the privilege of being at the altar this morning with them around me, and they made me feel very small, which is really humbling for a priest. I wanted to ask, because you've talked about Icarus, and you've talked about agency, and you've talked about being wounded and free, what relationship these pieces have to the notion of freedom? Because I think they are extremely powerful because of the medium, but also that you've highlighted the radio as, as a transporter of sound. And, and the radio was really important in terms of empire and allowing people to um, enact their agency um, towards a sense of liberation in terms of nation states. So I wondered what, 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 what these pieces say to you about freedom or if there's no relationship at all. Yeah, I mean, it, this is the thing that, yeah, the radio is a, it's one of those, as I say, when I say it's a platonic object, it's like the other objects in this church, and that they, to me, they read as part of the history of empire, kind of uncontroversially. And yeah, the word freedom is always, I mean, we know, you know, when, when the whole idea of freedom is cooked up in the, the imperial, sort of like the petro-colonial project that, you know, one man is free because many others are not. And as figures, you know, whether they're free, I mean, I'd say, well, there's a kind of abstract philosophical question of whether they're free if they're already kind of like, you know, tied to the ether. For me, the ether, I mean, this is something that I, uh, the universalism seems to be a very Christian thing. And I brought my Muslim friend to the sanctuary service a few weeks ago or when I was last here. And he enjoyed it, we both did, and we were there having some wine afterwards. And afterwards he said, you know, it's nice that you guys have this, but even the fact that this church can be open to LGBTQ uh, identities is itself like a, pro a product of the Christian universalization that says we all, all men, and the Muslims don't do that, and the Jews don't do that. You know, it's really a Christian thing, but also that we all, all men, um, that's the over-representation of, you know, man, genus, European subject over all others. So, uh, you know, I've been reading a lot of Sylvia Winter lately, who is amazing, and, and looks at how basically white supremacy and slavery and empire grows out of medieval theology. Um, and it's extremely dense and difficult to read, but also what an amazing project. She sketches it out very cleanly. So uh, the relation of freedom, I mean, you know, I don't know what I can say about it in terms of these guys in particular, but um, it's, it's already, it, you know, Lucy was talking about sitting with two things. I feel like I am, you know, white European subject, so I'm sort of operating in this, lineage. That's my theology. And I started studying theology, honestly, to learn more about how capitalism and white supremacy came to be these, these universal, or more or less universal, universalizing principles. And then I, I thought these things have got to be theological. They don't make sense otherwise. I don't believe Marx. That's all the econ economics. So that's why I started studying them. I mean, this is also part of what I meant when I said I wanted to make something agonistic but not antagonistic. Because I didn't want to make Christian work in the sense that I didn't want to unproblematically replicate some of the things that the church likes to tell itself um, that, you know, that I'm not, I'm not, I think that need to be looked at again now. And I'm not necessarily saying that I'm the one to look at them, but Icarus is militaristic, Batman is a, is a military figure. I mean, these are what I call, you know, is the unconscious of empire, which is working in me and many people, most of us, I'd say. And I think that the unconscious is working through the artist, you know. And where I try and put my politics and my thinking is the gaps where, where I, you know, the decisions I make through my unconscious, which nonetheless, is a standard issue, white, Christian, European unconscious. And I'm trying to 
fuck with those archetypes a bit that I was born with, inherited, completely didn't question, don't have the apparatus to question, don't learn it in school, don't learn it in church. And, but I'm quite, that is my project actually. As an intellectual project, that's what I think the most about. And, and I haven't spoken about it in this context, but that is part of it. And also, you know, why I'm very drawn to the church, but very ambivalent for these reasons. And the failure and hubris, that's part, of, that's part of it. I think the failure and hubris is also the story of the church, not just the human over-representation of man above actually humanity, but also the, the story of what the church has done. There was a reporter from the tablet who came to talk to me and he said, what theologists have you been looking at? And I said, well, uh, um, Blas Casas. You know, the guy who had this famous argument about whether, you know, the other was actually a human being or not. And it was a theological argument. Anyway, it's a bit of a long answer to the question of whether. So these, not in particular, but yeah, the fact of the radios, the fact of the, the, the you know, the, the, the army planes. For me, that's all part of something that I'm trying to interrogate. And in that is the false idea of freedom and even maybe a theological idea of freedom is tied up with that, you know, Eurocentric idea of the one man that's free that while the rest, because the rest are not. And yeah, I mean, as it happens, my parents were Buddhists, Protestants culturally, but Buddhists. So I kind of I had some different, um, the Buddhist idea of freedom is completely different. <laughs> and so, yeah. I'm kind of working in different traditions, but yeah, that's what I'll say to that. We've got time for one more comment or question, if you, if there is one. Cornell. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, just slightly different uh, way of looking at this. Talk about the radios now. Radios have been as you talked about, I think generally correctly, but used uh, you know, to contact. But what about the negative use of radios? For example, uh, in Rwanda, the, the, uh, the massacres were kicked off by the message of killing the cockroaches. And people understood exactly what was to be done with that and started that. I'm from the United States, and I'm thinking of an example of Reverend Coughlin, which most people probably haven't heard of, but he uh, had 80 million people listen to him every week, and he was, he, towards the end, he started doing anti-Semitic things and fascist things. So how do you fit the negative way of, you know, your... Uh, radio uh, get into how you work with all this? Well, I've never worked with radios before, so this is the first time. Um, I also didn't know that. But you know, what, what you can say about the radio is it's um, like all technology and theologies could also be called a technology, you know, ideas. Um, it really depends how they're used, but because of, as you said, like how their history, how they were developed, what they look like, um, basically, the, like they say, you know, um, technology is developed by sex commerce and the military, and radios are definitely the latter. And so it's, um, they're also propaganda technologies and military technologies, you know, so for me, um, Militarism is, you know, but I, I'm afraid I, I also tend to link militarism, well, I link militarism to the project of empire, which I link to the church. And it's, um, you know, thanks for pushing me on that stuff, because um, I probably wouldn't have said all that without these interventions, but it is, um, it's, it's part of what, I, I, again, I didn't want to be antagonistic. I don't want to, you know. I've also been invited here and I'm, I'm a guest, so I don't want to. But yeah, you're right to, you're right to 
point it out and, you know, to push on it. And what I would say always about work, you know, if this is what you see and experience from it, then that's what's there. And there's, in it, there's nothing that I can say about it to, to, to make that not so. And then we have to say, well, look, that's part of what it's doing. And I think that that's um, maybe more or less conscious, you know, but also more or less unconscious is both. So, yeah. Yeah, you're quite right to bring it up. The, yeah, the, the kind of bad history of the radio. I guess also what a radio is doing is there's only certain stations, so it's just picking up what's, what it's given. If you just look at it as an object, if, if each one of these is supposed to be a human being, it's not that they're casting around beyond, you know, that it's sort of like the best they can get is to, is to tune into something that someone's come up with already. You know what I mean? So like in, that's what I mean by propagandist. They'll only parrot what's, what's been given to them. So that's the other thing about a radio, yeah. Just repeat a little of what you said for the people in the and online as well. So partly because of the angles and also because they're off at the moment for you, they are, I think you just said, they're just trying to tune in. Could I say a huge thank you, Jesse? Um, in one of our conversations, you said something which really um, helped me as a, as, a, as a priest, but also helped me to understand what our you talk about your project, what our, what our project is here. And I think one of the effects that this conversation has had for me as one of the priests in this place is that it's helped me stand on, um, on a boundary or get closer to a boundary of human experience, which is, which is real and which is experienced by all of us in different times and different ways in our life. Um, so it's illuminated something of what it is to be human, which is around, for me, the... Um, the uh, subjects of uh, need and pain and desire and hope, but also a really important narration of failure. And one of the things that I often think about liturgy is we, we're trying to write stuff down that is not, we, we can't write it down. We, we can try, bless us. We're going to keep trying to find words for the thing, but it's not the thing. So the prayer is that it, we're in a penultimate, we're always in this penultimate state. And uh, this conversation, I think, for us, and for me particularly, has helped me go back and stand on that boundary, for which I'm incredibly grateful, um, because it, it draws us back from our tendency to hubris, which is, which is a constant uh, conversation for those of us who happen to be human in the world. Um, <laughs> Jesse, is there anything you'd like to say just by final word? Otherwise, what I think we might do is switch, switch miserere on and, uh, and then you take your time as, as you wish and go when you like. Just thanks. Thanks for your questions and thanks for coming. And thanks, Lucy Thank and you. Richard for everything. Fantastic. Thank you.